Do you know the phrase, there is no going back? We probably have heard that phrase, right? That, that refers to the fact that time moves in one direction only. It moves forward. And, and as we move forward through time, we pick up experiences in life. We, we experience things so that those experiences change us. And that transformation that occurs through our experience means that if we went back to a point in time to experience something that we had then with our current experiences it would be different. It wouldn't feel the same. We, we would think about the world differently because of our experiences in time. I, I remember going to my 10-year high school reunion. My, my class had 18 students. That was the size of my school. We, my school had 245 kids in K through 12 from the, in the year I graduated. I remember that. And that was pulling from a radius about 30 miles. This was every child in the community was in that school. My hometown was 300 people, and the school was small. It also meant that literally we lived our lives with one another. There, it wasn't like, you know, these were the kids I'd go to school with, but there were other kids in other schools that I would meet. Nope, nope, there were no other sports teams that I would meet kids on or, or clubs that I could join that would allow me to, to meet other kids. This was everybody. This was it. So I... The 18 kids in my class and the classes, you know, just above and below me, that was the world I lived in growing up in high school. So for that reason, we were close. I, I was very much looking forward to going back for my 10-year reunion. In, in the 10 years after high school, I had completed college. I, I met and married Grace and obtained a job that moved me here to Michigan. We'd seen Katie born by that time. So I, I didn't realize how much those experiences in those 10 years had changed me. When I got to the reunion, I quickly realized that there were a few of my classmates that had largely been frozen in time over those 10 years. They, they were classmates that had remained in our town or, or in the immediate area. They had worked either, there was one that worked a local job in town, the rest were, had started farming in the community. So the experiences they had over the 10 years were largely the same types of experiences as they'd had in their high school years. They, they had experienced very little that, that would be different. They, they were still experiencing things like I did when I grew up. You know, we, we lived, I had mentioned uh, yesterday to someone that, that our hometown was small enough it was 45 miles to McDonald's. Well, they still experienced it was 45 miles to McDonald's. The, the biggest event was high school basketball games. That was still their biggest events. So when we started talking to each other, the, these classmates primarily want to reminisce about those high school times because that was their memories. By, by contrast, some of my other classmates had had similar experiences to mine. Some had attended college and had gotten various kinds of jobs. Some had moved to other parts of the country. Others had, had started families. I found myself in this reunion spending more time talking with classmates that had moved from my hometown than I spent talking to those that were still in my hometown. I, I, I realized that while I very much appreciated my hometown, I appreciated my high school, I appreciated my, my growing up, I could never really feel the same way again about it. I, I could not go back. My experiences over the 10 years, they changed me to the point where my interests were just not the same as those interests had been when I was in high school. Well, this morning, we will see that our experiences with Christ have a similar effect on us. Christ changes us, and there is no going back to our former life. Paul has been encouraging us in his letter through the Colossians to, to gaze on Christ, to, to keep our gaze upon him. He wrote this letter to the church in Colossae, warning the church there about dangers. Well, we need to heed these warnings as well. We face many of the same dangers. 
As we looked at chapter 2 and the start of chapter 3, we, we, we've been picturing the Christian life as, as the straight road that we're to follow. Christ is at the end of this road. We keep our gaze fixed on him. Uh, on both sides of the roads, there's these dangerous cliffs. Uh, on the one side, we, we name the cliff legalism, the, the attempt to, to earn a right standing before God through our own efforts, to, to become righteous through our own efforts. Well, Paul warned us that, that Satan, he tries to distract us with things that, that cause us to look off in that direction. As we look in that direction, we drift over that cliff. We need to remember, we cannot do anything to make ourselves right before God. Christ alone is our righteousness. Well, last week, Paul reminded us again to keep our gaze fixed on Christ. We keep coming back to that same idea. Fix your gaze on Christ. Look at him. As, as Paul shifting his, his warnings from the cliffs on this side to the cliffs on the other, he looked across the road again and says, look at Christ. Fix on him. He gave us that reminder as he began to get ready to look at this other cliff. Really, the, the idea is if we cannot contribute to our own righteousness, then, then the natural question that comes to mind is, well, then does it matter at all what we do? After all, does it make sense if we cannot add anything through our own actions to our righteousness, then we cannot do anything to subtract from our righteousness either? Doesn't that make logical sense? Well, as we'll see this morning, that's essentially the logic that Satan dangles before us as he tries to give to fall over the cliff on the other side of the road. Now, I've named that cliff antinomianism or licentiousness. Yeah, I've mentioned that the previous weeks, and I kept telling you I'll, I'll define it soon, so we probably should do that finally. It, you may recall I defined legalism, as I said already, as the pursuit of righteousness through personal effort. Legalism is, is this cliff that we fall off when we try to gain a right standing with God through our own efforts. Well, the cliff on the other side is almost the exact opposite. Am, antinomianism or licentiousness. That, that, the word antinomianism really means against law. Anti means against something. Nomian means law. So it's, it's the idea of against law. Living without acknowledging any external restraints whatsoever. There is no moral law that can tell me what I can and cannot do. Essentially, that is the spirit of our age. No one can tell me how to live my life. I should be able to live my life however I want. No one has the right to place moral limits on another person's behavior. Not even God. That is the spirit of our age. That spirit of our age has crept into our church more than any of us would like to admit because that spirit of our age has crept into our lives more than any of us would like to admit. This cliff is a real danger for us. Now, before we start looking at our text this morning, I do want to mention that I'm violating one of the main principles that I have surrounding sermon text selection. I, I, I diligently stick to grammatical units when, when I select my sermon text. I, I believe that, that words have meaning within sentences, sentences have meanings within paragraphs, paragraphs within context. So when I select my units for a sermon, they, they need to be a grammatical unit. This morning I'm breaking that principle. It, it bothers me probably more than it will bother you, but, but it does bother me after... 12 years, I think this might be the only time other than when I did like a topical series when we looked at love where I'm doing this. This morning I'm breaking it because essentially we're, we're breaking our text right in the middle of a sentence. Literally in the middle of Paul's thought. Paul is creating a contrast. This versus that. And as you might guess from the title of the sermon, if you saw that there, we're considering our former life. Paul creating a contrast. Our former life to our new life. Yet Paul says so much about both sides of this contrast, so much about our former life and so much about our new life, that I decided we're going to take two sermons to, to be able to slow down and, and absorb both sides of this contrast. So I want you to keep that in mind this morning. You're only hearing half of Paul's thought. This is only half. This is the half of here's what was. We'll get to Lord willing what is next week. So what is the idea Paul's bringing out in the first half of the contrast? 
Well, it's this idea, if we keep our gaze fixed on Christ, fixing our gaze on him stops us from returning to the former life. Fixing our gaze on Christ stops us from returning to the, our former life. Let, let's read our text this morning. We're in Colossians 3, we're picking up in verse 5, and I'm actually going to read all the way through Paul's thought, down through verse 11, even though we're only looking at verse, through verse 9 today. Paul says, therefore, notice again, we're, we're starting with that word therefore, he it, it assumes that we are fixing our gaze on Christ, assuming we're, we're seeking the things above, as he said last week in verse 1, assuming that we're setting our minds on things above in verse 2, making these assumptions, the implication therefore is, therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. But Christ is all and in all. Lord willing, we'll look at verses 10 and 11 next week. This week, we're going to to look at the first half of Paul's thought here. Fixing our gaze on Christ stops us from returning to our former life. So, in order to do this, in in order to keep our gaze fixed on Christ, in order to make sure we're not returning to our former life, Paul says there's two things that we need to do. Two things that he lays out, the logical implications. If you're keeping your gaze on Christ, if you're going to avoid this cliff over here of antinomia, you're going to stay away from licentiousness, what do you need to do? Well, first, we must kill sinful desires. We must kill sinful desires. The the New American Standard that I read translates the command that Paul gives us in verse 5 as, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. In, In my opinion, that's too mild of a translation for for the imperative that Paul uses. Paul uses the word that literally means means kill, put to death. Put to death the part of your body which is on the earth. Think of it this way. You you all know I like to go deer hunting. Well, there's a vast difference for me thinking about deer hunting and the actual hunt. Today, I could think about deer hunting. In, In my mind, I could think about that time that will come in fall, and I could... Think about the deer that could come in front of me, and I could consider that deer is already dead. But when I go hunting, I am not going to sit in my deer blind and consider the deer as he walks in front of me being dead. I'm going to take my gun, and I'm going to kill it. Now, that that may trouble some sensitivities of some of you, but that's what hunting is. It's putting to death the animal that's being hunted. That's what Paul calls us to do in this verse. Put to death the parts of the body which are on the earth. Of course, I assume that the New American Standard translates the verb as consider as dead because Paul isn't calling for actual suicide here. He's not saying put to death your body that's on the earth. After all, all the parts of my body are on the earth, right? Here's where I live. Here's where I breathe. No, he's using the body metaphorically, the parts of the body, body parts. He, he, he's picturing certain types of sins as if they were earthly appendages on our bodies. And he's saying, we can kill these parts independently of the entire body. We can lop them off and kill just a part of it. I'm calling these sins sinful desires. They're they're desires that are part of that former life, the the life we had pre-Christ, before we accepted Christ as Savior. Remember, Paul's writing to believers. This letter is to a group of believers, those who have trusted in Jesus for their salvation. His assumption is that all of his readers have this former life. All of his readers have a new life. So he's telling his readers, kill sinful desires. 
Well, if we have a former life, and we have a new life because we've trusted Jesus as Savior, we must kill sinful desires. For, for just a few minutes, we need to briefly explore what this command means for us. It's a command. Well, I want to do that by, by considering the, the what and the why of the command. First, let's consider the what. The what. Wanting things that God hasn't given us. Paul lists off five of these types of things in verse, in verse 5. Immorality, impurity, passion, evil, evil desire, and greed. It, it seems all of these might actually be items of a sexual nature. The, the first three, immorality, impurity, passion, those, those clearly are. The desire is really a word that can be either good or bad. It, it's a, a general word, but Paul adds the adjective evil, so we know it's clearly a bad desire. Often evil desire takes on a sexual nature too. E even greed in the context could have that nuance. After all, if you think about the Ten Commandments, when we're told thou shalt not covet, we're told things not to covet, and one of them is the, our neighbor's wife. Sexual immorality in all of its forms ultimately is wanting something God has not given us. Not only do we want something God has not given us, Paul makes it clear from the last item that, that such a desire ultimately boils down to idolatry. We, we tend to think of idolatry as, as worshiping a false god, bowing before a, a, a statue or an image. And, and we don't think of sinful desires as worship. Well, I, I hope we all recognize how much sinful desires can capture our thinking. We've all had that experience where, where we want something that God has not given us and it captures our thinking. We want things so much that, that we then end up structuring our day around finding a way to get what we want. How is that not a form of worship? When we're allowing our minds to meditate on an image, a desire, and when what we're meditating on is something God has not given us, how is that not idolatry? We are worshiping something other than God at this point in our life. That's what Paul is warning us about. Idolatry, worshiping a desire that God hasn't given us. A sinful desire. Because God hasn't given it to us. The obvious implication from verse 5 is, is that this wanting is strong. We, we, we cannot ignore it hoping it will go away. We must actively kill it. That's particularly true of sexual desires. As we discussed here in our series through the Song of Solomon, God created us with, with these desires. These are strong, natural desires, but then sin has, has twisted them. The desire is at the core of our being, but so is sin, and swin, sin has corrupted it and twisted it. But it hasn't removed it. The desire is, is still there, and Satan now seeks to use this twisted desire as something he can dangle in front of us, something that, that looks like it is good, that our minds tells us will feel good, Satan dangles us there right until we fall over that cliff of licentiousness or antinomianism. Nobody can tell me I have to deny myself this desire I want. We must kill sinful desires. The, the what of Paul's first command is, is our wanting of things God has not given us. Now let's think about the why. Why must we do this? Because such warrants the wrath of God. Look at verse 6. Such warrants the wrath of God. Paul writes, For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Now, now, by the way, there is a question in the ancient manuscripts whether the final phrase, upon the sons of disobedience, was in Paul's original letter to the, the church in Colossae or not. It, it may have inadvertently been placed there by some early copyists because the, it's a phrase that's very familiar from Ephesians 5.5 5, where there's no doubt it was part of Paul's letter. And depending on your English version, various translation committees have come to different conclusions about whether that phrase should be in or not. So, your English may or may not have that last phrase in, in verse 6. 
Either way, Paul's point is unaffected. The, the corrupted, twisted, sinful desires of mankind is what calls forth the wrath of God. God will not ignore sinful desires. The, the idea is a little bit like how certain things called forth my wrath as dad. Uh, I've, overall, I'm a pretty easygoing guy. I, and I think sometimes my wife probably wished my parental fatherly wrath would come forth more quickly and easily than, than it did at times because I probably overlooked a number of things that I should have addressed in our children. One thing, though, that did call for my, forth my fatherly wrath every time was any blatant disrespect of grace. I would not allow my children to in, intentionally act or, or speak in a way that disrespected their mother. They, they quickly learned that was a no-go zone in our house. If they disrespect my wife, wrath was coming. Well, sinful desires are a no-go zone for God. They call forth His divine wrath. God is coming. And when He comes, He will deal with people who are characterized by these desires. Now, look at verse 7. And in them, you also once walked. In other words, we were such people ourselves. Paul writes that we were living in these sinful desires. We were comfortable in them. They were our natural desires. This was home to us. These sinful desires that, that called forth God's wrath. The obvious implication is that God's wrath was coming our direction. If God should have shown up while we were walking in these things, we would have felt His full, holy, divine, righteous, just, terrifying wrath. Understanding that should leave us shaking in our boots. If it were not for the glorious word once in that verse, along with the past tense walked and we're living, we'd be shaking now. You once walked when you were living in them. Have you ever had a near miss of something really dangerous? Maybe there was a car accident that happened just ahead or just behind you and you just missed it. That near miss undoubtedly gave you a shot of adrenaline that left you numb when you realized afterwards how close you were to serious injury. Folks, we just missed the wrath of God. We missed it because it did not arrive until after we started gazing on Christ. Let me just say, remember, I, I said that Paul is writing this to believers, people who have placed their faith in Jesus for their salvation. If that's not you, if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you do not recognize that He died for your sins, that your sins deserve the wrath of God, but He died in your place, if you've never recognized that, never accepted that, He died for you and ask God to take His death in your place, to accept his sacrifice on your behalf. If, if you've never done that, God's wrath is still heading your way. That car is heading directly at you. And it won't miss. For the rest of us, let's marvel at the near miss. Why did God wait so that we could gaze on Christ Why us? The, the answer from the first chapter of the letter is God's grace. His undeserved favor. God chose to wait so that we could gaze on Christ. And having escaped God's wrath now because of God's grace, having escaped this near miss, why would we want to return to the sinful desires that, that called forth the wrath in the first place. When, when I was at home in high school, I have mentioned before, we raised sheep. Some of the sheep would be convinced that the, the grass on the other side of the fence was better than what they were fed. 
And sheep you keep in with woven wire fence. You may not know that name, but it's the fence that gives squares, about four inch squares. Because sheep don't feel electric fence. Their wool is an insulator, but they, they can't get through this, this woven wire, the, the, you know, these little squares, one after the other. They, they can't get through. But they can stick their heads through. And they can try and reach that grass on the other side. And as they're pushing for that grass, their wool gets wrapped in, that, in the wire. And pretty soon they're stuck. And they start crying because they're stuck. So I'll go out and you have to essentially cut them loose. You have to cut through the wool so they can get loose. And you know, some of the sheep would go eight feet down and be stuck in another hole before I could even walk back to the house. They're that stupid. Why are we that stupid? That we would reach back for the sinful desires that called forth God's wrath that just missed us because we got to gaze on Christ. The proper, reasonable response is to seek to kill that which presents this danger to us in the first place. Let's not look at that dangling light that Satan's hanging out there. Let's kill it. We must kill sinful desires because such warrants the wrath of God. That is why. Fixing our gaze on Christ stops us from returning to our former life. To avoid turning to our former life, the, the first thing we must do is, is kill sinful desires. That will keep our gaze fixed on Christ. Second, there's another thing Paul tells us to do. We must avoid sinful speech. Avoid sinful speech. Verse 8. But now. Don't you just love those words? But now. Those are glorious words. It's similar to the song of the month we're singing where you may have noticed in quotes it said over and over, but God. is another way the scripture creates this contrast. But God did this. But now the implication is God did something for us. We had a former condition, but now everything's changed. In this case, now we're walking in the realm where God's wrath is not falling. We were walking in the realm of sinful desires, but we're not now. And since our situation has changed, Paul says that calls out a second obligation. Another thing we must do, we must avoid sinful speech. Specifically, he writes that we must put them all aside. That's the command he gives. It's a, a command, an imperative, an instruction. We must put them aside. We must set aside the things that are naturally a part of this former life, very much like I take my coat off and then set it aside when I'm done with it. That's the idea. Again, let's ask the what, though. What are we to lay aside? Let's examine this what. The what is wanting to promote self over others. Wanting to promote self over others. That's the way I'm summarizing the list that Paul gives here in verses, um, where are we at now? Eight and nine. Much like the, the verse in, in verse five, the, the first list, the, the list of five things we had there, Paul gives five more in verse eight. He says, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech. I, I would suggest that all of these things display themselves through, through sinful speech. That's really what we're talking about. Sinful speech here. Speaking in a manner that, that is rebellious, anti-God, unholy. In, in fact, Paul clarifies that all of these things are dealing with sinful speech because he adds that phrase in the last, to the last time, with your mouth. The mouth is our organ of speech. It's our mouth we use to do these things. Yet, unlike the, the first list where he had five and then a clarification... Paul goes on in verse 9, and he actually adds a sixth, a sixth item here. He, he lists it as a separate statement, but it still has to do with speech. He says, do not lie. Specifically, do not lie to one another. We must avoid sinful lying within the church. Speculating just a little bit here, it seems as if Paul adds this sixth item here in preparation for dealing with unity in the church. He'll move into issues of unity in, in, in the letter here, and he's beginning to deal with that here, setting up the, the framework for it. Because nothing destroys unity quicker than lies. Further, 
Lying is about as fundamental to our sinful nature as breathing is to our physical life. We instinctively lie. If you don't believe that, hang out with some toddlers for a while. Hang out with some toddlers. Tell a toddler to stop playing with his toys and come to the table. It's not unusual to find your instruction is ignored. Jimmy, did you stop playing with the toys like I told you to? Yes. Then what is that in your hand? Nothing. Isn't that your toy? No. We don't teach a child to lie. I'm quite sure my children were lying to me long before they had the cognitive ability to to catch me in any of the lies that I told. And yes, I'm sure I told lies. You know, things like, we're all out of ice cream, even though there may be ice cream in the, the basement freezer, just not in the one they're looking in. I'm sure they were lying long before they had the cognitive abilities to figure out, you know, Dad doesn't always tell us the truth. They lied before they were taught to lie. They lied before they could follow a model of lie. They lied because it was natural. It's instinctive. It's part of the sin nature at its very core. And it's still somewhat instinctive for all of us. I am sure you are similar to me in that I have to work hard to remain truthful at times when I know that the result of of telling the truth is going to create some sort of a challenging situation, at least from my perspective, an uncomfortable situation. My my instinct is to fib, to tell a half-truth, to deceive, to leave something out to just avoid the problem that full truthfulness will bring. Yet lying is just one type of sinful speech that Paul says, I am to lay aside, along with anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech, lying should not have a place in my life. Look carefully at this list. These are things that I suspect most of us, maybe all of us, are much more nonchalant about these things, than we were the items in verse 5. We would agree that that we should have nothing to do with immorality or impurity. But anger? We excuse the things in verses 8 and 9 in our lives. We're only human after all, right? I'm angry because it's just who I am. I'm an angry person. Or I have reasoned because, you know, that guy cut me off again. Well, I want you to remember is Paul uses an imperative there again in verse 8. Put them all aside. Controlling our anger is not optional. Refraining from speaking badly about someone else is not optional. Avoiding lying is not an option. It's a command. And I summarized all these things as a desire to promote self over others because that is our underlying motivation that that drives each of these actions. The reason we get angry, the reason we have wrath or malice, slander, etc. is because we want to promote ourselves. Someone or something is interfering with our little universe. That, that world that revolves, in my case, around Dwight. That is the center of the universe. At least, Satan tells me it should be. Dwight should be the center of everything. So I use my speech in various ways to attempt to, to recenter the physical world that forgets to revolve around Dwight. I, I try to use my speech to recenter things around me. We must avoid sinful speech. Speech that comes from wanting to promote self over others. Now let's ask the why question. Why? Why? Because we have changed. Why should we lay these types of speech aside? Because we have laid aside the old self. We have changed. There there are things 
that are part of what we were, but that's not what is. We are no longer those things. They are behind us. They're, they're part of a past. None of these types of speech are part of the Christian life. They, they don't lie ahead as we gaze upon Christ. They lie in the past. You know, there's a lot of car accidents that occur because people reach into the back seat for something. They're, they're convinced that I can keep my car going straight and reach for this at the same time. I, I'll keep in my lane. And they believe that until it's too late. They stop believing it when they, they hear the crash. Well, time and again, Satan uses situations in our lives to, to try to get us to look back over our shoulder and see how we used to handle the situation. And then he says, just reach for that again. Reach for that anger. That's how we handle it. I mean, we live in an angry world, don't we? And Satan says, well, that's, you're comfortable in this anger. Reach for that. But we don't have to fall for that ploy. Our old self is laid aside. We have laid us aside. It's a past tense. Because we're in Christ. Put off what we've laid aside. Put them all aside. Because you laid aside your old self. It's not who we are. Our old self is laid aside from the moment we accepted Jesus as Savior. That old self has been taken off, like I'd take off my suit coat and tossed aside. We're changed at that very moment. Our life changed. Our desires changed, at least to some extent. God's expectation of us has also changed. He changed us inwardly, and he changed how he expects us to live. Look at these words again. You laid aside your old self with its evil, supplied by the context, practices. It happened. Friends, there's two implications here that I want to, to make real quick from this, this past idea. It, it's happened. We've changed. One means that even at the very outset of, of our salvation, the, the day you accepted Jesus as Savior, you had changes in your life. There, there is no Christian who has not laid aside the old self. Every Christian has. Changes are inevitable. If there's no change in your life, then there's no salvation. Two, these sinful speech things, they're, they're no longer the only things that are natural to you. Yeah, lying was natural to us. So was anger and all these others. But now, resisting them is also natural. Yes, as, as Paul describes elsewhere, this, this resistance is going to feel like there's a never-ending war in our minds. There, there's this battle going on because the, this old nature instinct is still there naturally wanting us to lie, and our new nature says, no, we cannot lie in Christ. And, and there's this mental battle going on because now we can resist. We are changed. And for that reason, it matters what we do. Paul is warning us about, remember, the idea is saying, it's trying to say, it doesn't matter what you do. You can't earn your righteousness in the same way, so you can do whatever you want. Paul is saying it does matter what we do. We cannot live however we might like. Instead, we are to fight the daily battle to live the reality that this sinful speech tendency is not who we are in Christ. We do not need to reach back for it. We need to keep our gaze fixed on Christ. We are changed. And for that reason, we can keep our gaze fixed on Christ. Fixing our gaze on Christ stops us from returning to our former life. To avoid returning, the, the second thing that Paul says we need to do is we must avoid sinful speech. I, I mentioned my 10-year my reunion, that it brought home the, this concept that there really is no going back. That the 10 years had changed me sufficiently that I no longer had the same interests as my classmates who had experienced very few new things in those same years. 
Well, to a much greater extent, Christ has given us new experiences. He has changed us completely. When we place our faith in him, we have new life. Our old life is a disconnect from our new. Of course, Satan is constantly trying to pull us back to, to, to living as if our lives are not in Christ. In fact, one of the tricks he uses, the, the distractions he, he dangles there is to, to tempt us to just live our lives however we want, do what feels good, whatever we please. Those distractions, as I said, leaves us to fall right over the cliff of antinomianism or, or licentiousness. The, the solution is keep our gaze fixed on Christ. Fixing our gaze on Christ stops us from returning to our former life. It stops us. This morning, there's two things that Paul says you must do to keep your gaze fixed on Christ. Two things that stop you from returning to your former life. They're, they're part of what was, not what is. We need to avoid sinful desires. Because sinful desires were what was, not what is. We need to avoid sinful speech. Sinful speech is what was, not is. Both were part of our former life. They are not part of our life in Christ. They only come back into our life when we take our gaze off Christ and look elsewhere. Fixing our gaze on Christ stops us from returning to our former life. Let's pray. Father, again, we praise you for your word. We thank you that you inspired your apostle to write these warnings to this church because you knew they were warnings that every church would need. And Father, we need these warnings. We need these warnings as a church. We need them individually because individually we are the ones who will bring sin and disunity into our church. So Father, I pray that you would work in each of us today. Help us to examine ourselves, to see where we're allowing ourselves to take our gaze from Christ and once again return to living in a way that is inconsistent with who we are in Christ. Allow us to resist the temptation to look for pleasure and fulfillment and satisfaction in any other way than Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.